Ten seconds. Jesus, you know, they just kind of 
fake it? Like, what do I do? And what he was describing, whether he realized it or not, what he was describing is he hadn't put his faith. He didn't. A lot of people go to church. A lot, a lot of people get engaged. A lot of people, a lot of people go to church their whole life. But the missing there, that gap, and many of you might be able to identify with this, is faith that you haven't made the decision to build your life on a different substructure, that you at this point haven't made the decision to do something different and live on a set of rules and principles and foundations that aren't completely seen. And I gotta be honest, I said this last but I wanna say it again. And until that happens, church is just kind of weird. The Bible doesn't make a lot of sense. There isn't a whole lot in your faith, in, in your faith that's going to make sense without Faith. And so we want to be super clear, like faith is the key. That is everything. It makes everything else make sense. So we want to ask you to simply do this. We believe that, that God is asking you to go from your current frame of mind, your substructure in your life. And this is, this is if you've been a Christian for a long time or if this is if you haven't made this decision. He's asking you to take what you've experienced, what you know, what makes you feel happy, what makes you feel safe. He's asking you to what? Jump. He wants you to go. Oh no, I didn't make it. He wants you to go to a different substrate. My whole illustration was based on me making that jump. It's so small. Anyway, there is this gap that he wants you to cover, and that's what it means to have faith. Now, today what we want to do is we want to drill in a little bit deeper, and we want to talk about a question that probably comes up. Last week we said, what is faith? This week we want to say this. Why? Like, why why does God require faith? Why, why does he do this? In other words, like, what, wouldn't it be easier if, if God just showed up, right? Because this is the way it works, right? We, you ever have a mouse in your house? You know, and this, this is how it works. You're sitting there. I've lived in several houses like this. And I sit there. You're watching TV. And all of a sudden, you're like, what was that? Did you see that? What happened? I just saw something. And you think, oh, okay, well, maybe something out of my hand, and the next day, my wife's looking at me like I'm crazy, and then the next night, we're watching TV or something, and she goes, did you see that? Did you, did you see that? And you never, you never really like lay eyes on it, you never see it. And then a couple days later, you're like in the kitchen drawer, you know, and all of a sudden there's those little, those little pebbles, you know, those, you're like, I think we have a problem. But the thing is, you never saw the mouse. Right? You haven't ever seen it. You have every reason to believe. In fact, you would probably say 100% absolutely we have a mouse in the house, if not a bunch. And there's no way we can do it. And the only way to catch a mouse is to you know, lay a trap. I always just, uh, some people hide them and stuff like that. And I'm, I'm the kind of person that if I caught a mouse, I'd probably forget that I put the trap there. And then I'm just going to have a dead mouse there. So we just put it right on the kitchen counter. <laughs> And we came out one morning, and it looked like a mouse had struggled for their life all night long. There was blood everywhere, and uh, anyway, but no mouse, right? There was blood everywhere, but no mouse, and we're looking at it going. And that's the way it is in our relationship with God. We, we see God everywhere, and that's the way faith works, and we're constantly like, you know, I, I think I just saw God. I think, I think I just saw God, you know? But to lay our eyes, and we have to ask the question, why doesn't God just like wander into our living room? Why doesn't he appear every morning when you wake up in your room? The risen Jesus is in your room, right? Got nail holes in his hands, and you wake up and you go, could you just, you just prove to me you're Jesus? And boom, Starbucks and a scone right there. You know, he just makes it appear, and you're like, okay, you're Jesus, and we move on. Why, why is there this faith? Why do we have to believe in something we do not see? So that's the question we want to answer today. Let me answer it in a couple different ways. The first one, the first thing I want to say is just this, and this is, this is our, just our life experience teaches us. Every relationship, all relationships require faith. Every relationship, even relationships that are super visible and very practical, the people that you have a relationship with in your home, it requires faith. That's what we've experienced. Um, I tend to get a little restless at night. Sometimes if I'm really excited about something, not very often when I'm stressed about something, but when I'm excited about something, I can't sleep at night. <laughs> to this day, I can't, I still can't sleep the night before Christmas. Is there anybody like that? 
there's a, well, the kid, there's a kid raising their hand. Anyway, I still get a little giddy. I'm like, when the kids open up their presents, you know, anyway. So I get excited about stuff. So <clears throat> one night, and this happens quite a bit, I'll just kind of leave in the middle of the night. I'm like, I can't sleep. I'm going to go work on a sermon. I'm going to go do some work at the church. So I'll leave at like 1 o'clock in the morning a lot of times. And one particular night, I left at like 1 o'clock in the morning. My wife said, where are you going? I'm like, I'm going down to the church. So I go down to the church. And then I was there for several hours, and then I was just, you get to that point where you just can't sleep, so you just kind of stay up all night. Is any, any other night owls kind of like that? Kind of, no, this is the 9.30, never mind, so it's probably, anyway. So you get, I just get, get like that probably once every two weeks. One morning, it's like five in the morning, and I still am not anywhere near tired, so I went and got a bunch of pancakes, okay? By myself in the middle of the night, or I go get a hit that, that was delicious, and I came home, and it was about 5.30, and I, I go to bed, my wife's still asleep, so I actually fall into bed now, get an hour of sleep before I have to take the kids to school. So I fall into bed, and my wife went up sticky from pancakes. Now what does that sound like to you? That sounds kind of like the behavior of a pothead, doesn't it, right? And my wife rolls over, and she says, where, where have you been all night? And I'm like, well, I worked all night, and I was just out all night, and then I went and got some pancakes. And my wife could have thought a bunch of things, right? She could have thought, man, he's could have been the arms of another woman. She got snickers when I say that. But anyway, <laughs> could, have, could have been in that situation. I could have been in a strip club, right? I could have been doing a lot of things. And she, But her reaction was, oh, okay. And she falls back to sleep, never even thought anything about it. Because in a relationship, any relationship that you have, you have to have faith. And as I tell that story, there's probably somebody out there going, girl, you better watch out. Because... Because what you had happen in your relationship, you were in that same thing, and you put that faith into it, and they were out of a strip club, or they were out smoking pot and eating pancakes, or something like that. You know, they, you had experience where you put the faith there, and it didn't really work out. But whether you like it or not, whether it's a good relationship or a bad relationship, you have to, to have a relationship. You have to put faith into the relationship. It takes faith to have a relationship with and God is no different. God says, I, you have to have faith in me. Just like anybody else, you have to have faith in me to have a relationship with me. In fact, it's a really big deal to God. In Hebrews chapter 11, uh, verse 6, he says this, And without faith, it is impossible to please God. And now, that's true with anybody. Any relationship that you've ever had without that faith, it's impossible to please them or to have a relationship with them. That's all this is saying. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Earnestly seek him. Now think about that. If you've got a friend and they're like, you know, they kind of punch you on the shoulder and they're like, you know what? I really like you. You're my BFF, right? That happens with a lot of guys, right? You're best friends forever. Anyway, you have that relationship with that person. You're like, that's nice. We're buds. Great. We go hang out at Wild Wings. But then all of a sudden, your friend does an incredible sacrifice to get to you, right? I had a buddy one time save me from a tornado, or at least he thought he was saving me from a tornado, right? He, he comes to my house in the middle of the night, and he busts down my door because there's a tornado siren going on, right? He busts down my trailer door, okay? And he doesn't know this about me, but I'm like, just kill me. I don't want to, it's not worth, like, hiding from a tornado. I just hope the you know, tornado, okay, anyway, he wants to have, and he's so, it's important to me that he busts down my door and rushes into my bedroom, I just newly married my wife. Anyway, he rushes in there to save me, and he is, by doing this, he's showing me, like, you are indeed my friend. That's, that's what Hebrews 11, 6 is saying. God wants you to have faith in him. God wants you to earnestly seek him. And faith, faith requires that we have a little bit of earnestness, a little bit of determination to have that relationship with God. Second thing I want to say about answering the question, why does God require faith? Because seeing God, right? If God really appeared in your room and produced Starbucks and a scone every morning, 
you might think, man, that would really help a lot because I would just have a lot more you know, belief in him. Probably not because seeing God doesn't really work. Today I want to revisit the Israelites. Uh, the Israelites were uh, probably the biggest thing that ever happened to them. They saw God. They saw God in a way that we would only hope to see God at work. They saw God part the Red Sea. I want to revisit that story. I just want to catch like what they really saw. So here's how it goes. They come out of Egypt. God has already done all this incredible stuff, and he's rained down the ten plagues, and there's all that. And so they're out there, and they're like, wow, we're free people. They're just starting to experience their freedom, and they get all the way to the edge of the Red Sea. And then they look back, and all of a sudden, God had changed Pharaoh's heart. And Pharaoh and all of his armies were like, what did we do? We got rid of all of our employees. We got rid of all of our slaves, right? We need to go get them. So he rounds up the troops, and they go out and chase them. And the Israelites are pinned up against the Red Sea. Now, in the movies when you see this, if you see the Ten Commandments or you see the Prince of Egypt or those animated series, they always kind of get a few things wrong. There's always some missing parts and there's, there's always like this panic that happens and you never really see the picture of how it actually works. So I want to paint that picture just real quick. That picture looks like this. There was an angel out in front leading the people. There was this cloud that appeared during the day, and this big pillar of cloud, and it would move around, and they would just sort of follow it around. And then at night, it would turn into a cloud of fire. Right? So they're watching this angel, like, lead them, and they're watching this pillar of cloud, like, lead and guide them, and they're just kind of following it around and moving with it. Then they see the Egyptians. This is how the story goes. It says in uh, Exodus 14, then the angel of God, who had been traveling in front of Israel's armies. Right, we don't know much about this angel, but I guarantee you, like, angels are, like, big things in the Bible. They're not, like, these cherubs floating around with these little baby wings or anything. These, this, is, this is a big, powerful angel. He was probably something that caused a lot of awe. He definitely had a massive beard. Anyway, he was... He was he was in front of the people, and the people were in awe of him, and all of a sudden, they just sort of watch. They're like, oh no, Egyptian's army, and then they look over at the angel, and they just see the angel. I don't know if he floats, or if he flies, or maybe he just walks through the crowd, but they're just like, they watch this angel go around behind them, and then they see this, this pillar of cloud move around behind with him. It says, the angel of God, who had been traveling in front of Israel's army, withdrew and went behind them. The pillar of cloud also moved from in front and stood behind them, coming between the armies of Egypt and Israel. Throughout the night, the cloud, catch this, the cloud brought darkness to the one side and light to the other side. Now, they always depict it in the movies that it's always during the daytime, so you, know, you can see everything. But here's basically what's happening. This cloud goes around, and it's got darkness on one side and light on the other. And what you might think is the light was on the Israelites, but what I think, I think is that there was basically this blazing fire light that lit up like the day sun, the Egyptian camp. And all the Israelites were in darkness. So this wind that comes to part the Red Sea, it comes, and they can't see anything. And they're just like, I can't, you know, it's nothing. We can't even tell what's happening. So, neither went each other all night long. The Egyptians were like, well, I can't even tell what's happening over there. We'll just stay back here. Plus, there's an angel and fire happening. That's bad. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and all night the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it into dry land, and the waters were divided. Just imagine this. All night long. They're in the darkness, and there is this crazy strong wind. They would have had to have been an incredibly strong wind that is happening all night long in the darkness. And they're watching it happen. It didn't just happen in like five minutes. They're watching this thing happen. And they just have to be sitting there going, oh, I can't believe it. I can't believe what I'm watching. All night long, they watch this happen until the ground was dry. The waters were divided, and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right side and their left. Now, here's the part in the movie that was 
It always shows them in a panic, like, hurry up, hurry up! You know, they're trying to get everybody out of the Red Sea, move across, because the Egyptian armies are coming. And it doesn't really say that. It says that they just kind of, remember, because the entrance is blocked, basically, by this angel. They're just kind of walking around. I think it would have been kind of like this. If you go through a Red Sea, if you go through a sea that's parted on both sides with water, I'm not sure what your reaction would be. I'm pretty sure mine would look kind of like this. Right? What a, that was cool. Right? And they, they just seem to be taking their time and moving across there, and they finally get to the end, and they walk out, and they're like, holy cow, that was the coolest thing I've ever done. I mean, this would have been like going to Disney World or something. It was just amazing what they experienced. They walked through on dry ground. The Egyptians pursued them, and all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and horsemen, horses followed them into the sea. Now, what kind of moron do you have to be to follow people into the sea? During the last watch of the night, the Lord looked down from the pillar of fire and cloud at the Egyptian army and threw them into confusion. Now, again, the Israelites are in safety. They're looking down. They're just going, okay, you know, they're watching all this happen. They're just like, man, they're thrown into confusion? But I bet the Israelites are laughing. I bet they're like, are you seeing this? Do you see what's going on down here? They're actually watching this mighty army thrown into confusion. He jammed the wheels of the chariots so that they had difficulty driving. And the Egyptians said, let's get away from the Israelites. See, they get it. It's kind of a too late aha moment. But they get it. In the middle of the sea, they say, the Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. And then this is what happens. This is God's last move. God goes <coughs> and as the Israelites man, they are just stand there watch that happen and this mighty army that they were so afraid of, that they were scared of, that they were under oppression from for 400 years, this army just disappears. They exist no more. Can you imagine the adrenaline rush that they're, they're just sitting on the edge going, oh, wow, they're watching this happen. I can't imagine the adrenaline rush. I, I mean, I don't know if you've ever like really watched a really good football game and had an adrenaline rush. I was watching a football game. I don't know if any of you saw it yesterday. It was, uh, uh, oh, it was Michigan versus Nebraska. That's right. I'm a little bit of a Nebraska fan. Anyway, at the end of the game when we scored the winning touchdown, right? And that was that was amazing. That was an adrenaline rush, right? For me. Anyway, it was a it was a good at least the Michigan State people can support me, right? Okay. <laughs> Alright, so we're we're watching this whole thing actually happen and it's adrenaline. Imagine that times like a billion, right? The, the adrenaline how excited you get, that's what the Israelites are experiencing. Right here in verse 31 it says, When the Israelites saw the mighty hand of the Lord displayed against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord and put their trust in him and in Moses as their servant. This, this continues on. And God's like showing, he's just bam, 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 bam. He's showing himself. That would have left you with a memory you think you'd probably take with you for the rest of your life. And then immediately after that, God does some things that follow that. Immediately after that, they go out into the wilderness, and they're three days without water, and this whole tribe of people, thousands, hundreds of thousands of people, are now very, very thirsty, and they're in the desert, and all of a sudden they come up to this water, and the water is bitter, and they can't drink it, and it's going to make everybody sick. And so Moses takes a log, and he throws it out in the water, and it makes the water drinkable, and everybody has thirst. So they see God, they see God purify water. A couple days later, they're starting to get hungry. They're like, okay, we're out in the middle of the desert. And God's really done some awesome things and stuff, but how am I going to eat? And so God creates a thing that nobody's ever seen before or since. He creates manna. And they wake up in the middle, and they wake up in the morning, and there is literally food that they've never seen before just laying all over the desert like dew. So God provides manna from heaven. A few days later, they start to be thirsty. And they're like, oh man, we need something to drink. We're in the middle of the desert. Moses walks up to a rock, and they see this with their eyes. He literally takes a staff and hits the rock, and water comes gushing from the rock, and they're able to drink. And then a few days later, they go up against, and then all of a sudden, they have their first enemy. And they see this army, and they're going to kill the Israelites, and they're like, oh no, what do we do? 
And all Moses does is put his hands in the air. And all of a sudden, the Israelites begin to win the battle. And then Moses is like, all right, that's cool. And he puts his hands down, and then they begin to lose the battle. And so he puts them up again. And he puts them, and he starts to, and they kind of figure it out. I would have loved, loved to see him do the math on that, right? Like, oh, oh. Well, look, five guys just done, right? There's just, he figures out that his arms have to be in the air. All he has to do is ask God. That's all he has to do. And so God fights with him. And so here's my point. They're seeing God. And they're seeing God. And every single day, the only way they exist is by seeing God. And then God gives them their first window, their first moment, where they don't see God. God leads them all the way to the edge of Mount Sinai. And Moses goes up on the mountain. And here's what's crazy. They knew Moses was up on the mountain. And it says that the Lord's presence came down on the mountain like a cloud, and they were able to see. They were like, yeah, Moses is with God. This is probably a good thing. And they see that happen. And here's what happens. My tab's gone. We'll just look at the screen here. When the people saw that Moses was so long and coming down from the mountain, again, see all these incredible things. And they're probably at this point, they're waiting somewhere between 6 and 20 or 30 days, something like this. It's just a little bit of a window. It's not even a month. When the people saw that Moses was so long and coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said, Come, give us something we can experience. Give us something we've experienced before. Give us something we can see. So come, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. And just like that, they wrote off Moses. Next verse. Aaron answered them, Take off the gold earrings that your wives, your sons, and your daughters are wearing and bring them to me. So all the people took off their earrings and brought them there. He took what they had handed him and made it into an idol, cast in the shape of a calf, fashioning it with a tool. And then listen to what they said. Then they said, These are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. They saw everything. God showed himself to them over and over again. And now they have this first gap where all they've got to do just hold on for a little bit. And they can't. They can't do it. And I just want to make this point. Seeing God that doesn't really work. If God answered every prayer that you've ever asked God to answer, it wouldn't work. If you woke up every morning and said, God, I would like you to create a giant pile of cash right here in my room. And God said, you know what, I just want you to know I exist, so I'm going to do it. It wouldn't work. Eventually, you'd find yourself in the same spot as the Israelites. And the first time God pulled back even a little bit, you'd be done with it. Faith is the only thing that works. And God says, the only way you're going to have a relationship with me is if you just believe in me. If you want to. The third reason that God requires faith the reality of God is clear. Okay, so the reality of God is, is clear. Like I said before, it's just like that mouse. You kind of kind of see it everywhere around you. He's made it clear. In Romans chapter 1, it tells us this. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wicked. Now, just kind of a side note. Notice it doesn't say will be revealed. He says it's being revealed. Go home and think about that. Revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what they may, what may be known about God is, what is it? It's plain to them. Because God has made it plain to them. Next verse. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, so not just that there is a God, but his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been what? They've been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. So here's kind of the bottom line. 
God has made himself clear. And if you're sitting out there going, well, I don't think he's made himself clear enough. <laughs> then maybe we should say it this way. God's made himself as clear as he's going to make himself. He has made himself clear. And you see it all the time. I remember when I was in high school, I was a freshman in high school, there was one of those moments. It was kind of an odd moment. Probably because I didn't pay attention in school. And so this was actually a, a, a big moment. But it was one of those moments where I realized why we have our calendar and why our calendar is the way it is. Right? I'm like 14 years old and I've never really even thought about it. And my buddy, who's Catholic, but not really a follower of God, is sitting next to me and I, he could tell I didn't know where the calendar came from. And I said, hey, you know, he turned to me and says, you know where we get our calendar from, right? And I'm like, yeah, because that's what you say when you're afraid. You answer yes to everything. Anyway, he, he could tell I didn't, so he, he continued on. He's like, our calendar's divided, you know, everything before Jesus and everything after Jesus. That hit me. I was like, are you kidding me? Like, I, I go to church, but I, my parents grab me to church. I don't really pay attention. I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, our calendar? is divided? It's, so you're telling me it was 1993 at the time. I'm like, it's 1993, and you're telling me that the reason it's 1993 is because it's 1,993 years since Jesus. He was like, yep. And that took me back. I was like, wow. Is that a sign or what? Spoke volumes. This is before I even made a decision to follow Christ. Spoke volumes. You see God everywhere. Everywhere in creation, you constantly see it. Some people are like, well, you know, it's, it's all got a scientific explanation and there's evolution. And I took a class in college called Creation and Evolution, or Creation Science, which basically talked about evolution and creation and why all the science behind creation. And, and you know, I'm not really a scientist and they made some really good stuff, but it, the, my bottom line was I'm like, you know what, creation, evolution, I don't really care. Where did it all come from? Like, what makes it all work? And have you seen it lately? It's pretty freaking amazing. And if you look over all creation, there is a big voice shouting, hey, this came from somewhere. God has made himself clear from what has been made. So my point is, God has made himself clear, or he's made himself as clear as he's going to be. And so that boils, and, and so Ralph Waldo Emerson says this, all I have seen teaches me to trust the Creator for what I have not seen. All I have seen teaches me to trust the Creator for all I have not seen. That's, that's what it means to have faith. And so if God is clear and He's revealed Himself, this is what everything boils down to. Faith boils everything down to your want to. It all comes down to that. Do you want to. Because listen, this is what's great. God doesn't say, hey, I, I need you to be clean. I need you to be sinless. I need you to be like me. I need you to do all that. God doesn't do that. He just says, Here's, this is all I need. This is all I need from you in the world. I just want you to want to. That's what faith is. And if you want to, then we have a relationship and everything changes. So if I can go back to the guy at the beginning, I mean, he's sitting there going, man, I just... I'm not there. I want to know how to get there. Or maybe you're at a stall. Maybe you've made the decision to follow Christ and you're just kind of stalled out. It all comes down to, do you want to? Are you going to be able to answer that question? What, is, what does God want? And I will do whatever you want. Absolutely no reservation, no holding back. I want to, I want to, I want to. That is the decision of faith, and that's why God requires faith, because he's actually trying to make it easier for us. All he wants is your wanting.